Welcome to NVIDIA and the Future of High Performance VR, presented by NVIDIA. Please welcome your speaker, David Coombs. Thanks, guys. How's it going? Sorry about that. We were having a, a little bit of IT issues. Maybe in the future we'll be able to do these in VR, and then that'll, that'll make it easier, right? So I'm going to talk about a bunch of different stuff that NVIDIA is doing with VR, and then I'm going to hand over to Victoria, and Victoria is going to talk about our VR Funhouse, which is uh, it's the first game that NVIDIA has ever released. It's in VR, and it uh, uses all kinds of crazy rendering technologies. We've got that in our booth, so come back to our little booth in the back of the, back of the hall and check it out if you haven't already. So most people know NVIDIA as they make graphics cards that people play video games with. But there's a lot more to NVIDIA than that. We're heavily involved in professional visualization. Pretty much any product you buy probably got touched by some Quadro software at some point. Pretty much any movie you see is probably being built using NVIDIA hardware. Um, and we're huge into deep learning and self-driving cars at the moment. Those are two things that we're working on. Deep learning has revolutionized the internet. It's changed the way that search works. It's changed the way that Facebook algorithms work to present you with information that you might be interested in. Um, we work with game developers, we work with the headset guys, we're working with every, every part of the VR ecosystem to try and make sure that people can have a successful, good experience. So that's, that's why I'm here talking to you guys today. It's not just about games. So I gave this presentation about six months ago in January at the Winter Expo, and I was like, well, I don't want to give the same slides again. So let, who, who was here last time? Anyone here last time? So I'm not going to give exactly the same slides as last time. So what's changed since then? Well, the, probably the biggest thing from our perspective is we released our Pascal architecture. So the previous architecture was Maxwell. Pascal is, a, is kind of a quantum leap forward from that. Significant performance across the entire range um, with better power efficiency. And on the GeForce and Quadro side, a lot of the architectural changes that were made and the changes in the driver were specifically for VR. So that's, that's the kind of stuff that I want to talk to you about today. Um, and you can see there we're showing a graph and we're showing that the 1080 is significantly more powerful than a 970. And the 970 was the recommended min spec at the launch of the Oculus and, and the Vive. So something else that happened at SIGGRAPH two weeks ago that's pretty exciting was we released a research paper we've done on perceptually based foveated virtual reality. Who, who knows what foveated rendering is? OK, so foveated rendering is when we're actually tracking where you're looking and where you look. We render the most amount of detail, and then we lower the amount of detail around that we, so we don't waste time shading pixels that the blurry part of your eyes are going to see. The middle of your eye sees in detail. The corners of your eyes see less detail. And the, the corners of your eyes also see less color, but they're very sensitive to contrast and movement. And the reason why is so that you know, when that dinosaur came to eat you, you'd see it out of the corner of your eye, right? It's a, it's a prey response. You have really good perception of movement out here, detail out here so you can gather fruit and capture animals, and then out here you have, uh, <laughs> out here it's, it's, it's I'm being hunted, right? So they did a bunch of research on foveated rendering. We, we can do foveated rendering, but how far can you drop the quality before people start to notice? And there were some really interesting psychological findings that came out of that research. So if you're interested in foveated rendering, I definitely recommend you check out that paper. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. Another thing is that we added VR support to iRay. iRay is our physically-based rendering um, solution. So it's a very, very realistic um, ray tracing solution that actually uses physical materials. So you have a piece of wood, it actually looks like a piece of wood. You have a piece of steel, it actually looks like a piece of steel. So if you're a product designer and you're making stuff and you want it to see what it actually looks like before you put it into production, you can do that and you can use iRay. So people who, who use that today, Ford use that on their cars, they'll actually test their materials and the interior of their car and they'll try different paint and different things like that. But you can imagine, I mean, why would you ever build anything if you could build it realistically in VR first? Right, imagine you're building an apartment complex. Being able to walk through the atrium and see what the size of that is, being able to walk in the different rooms, try out a different room at a different time of year. Like, what is this room like at midnight? What is this room like uh, midday on the 1st of January? Is this room warm and inviting, or is it cold and dark and gloomy? So you can pre-visualize all that and get an understanding of how anything that you make looks and feels in relation to human beings before you build it. And that's an incredibly powerful thing for VR. That's one of the most, I mean, I'm a game developer, but I think that the way that VR is going to affect product design and architecture and things like that is massive. So NVIDIA is not just a chip company. 
So obviously we make a lot of chips, but we back those chips with software, with drivers, with tools for developing software, and, and increasingly with um, you know, full ecosystems that enable people to come into, come into a problem space and solve it. And VR works is our SDK for um, people who are developing in VR. So we have a bunch of graphics capabilities. I'm gonna talk about that. We have some stuff that is just if you're developing a headset and you need really low latency and you need to be able to communicate with us. Um, you know, you need to be able to communicate with the GPU in a very efficient way. We have some stuff for that. Not really gonna talk about that today. I'm gonna to talk about VR audio. Audio is a new thing that we're doing in VR. It's pretty exciting. I've got some slides on that, which hopefully will be interesting. Physics, so how do, when we interact with VR in the real world, how do we connect those two things together? How does that work? You know, if you're gonna go pick something up in VR and it has a certain amount of weight, how do we, how do we make what your hand's feeling match? So that's something else that we're looking into. Again, at SIGGRAPH, we announced our 360 video SDK. So um, that's for people who are filming in VR and they wanna be able to take multiple streams of high definition content. They wanna be able to stitch it together into a, into a ball of video and then maybe be able to visualize that on set and be able to see what it looks like in real time. But then also they're gonna have tons of posts and we can help there. Obviously the GPU is great. If you need to warp images and, and blend them together, GPUs are ideal for that so we can help people cut down their production time massively. So there's a bunch of stuff there that we have that are gonna, gonna be available for, for helping developers. So let's, so who here is actually a developer? Okay, so we've got a bunch of coders in the room. That's gonna be interesting when we get to some of the stuff about 3D transformations, because you guys might understand it better than I do. So multi-res shading has been around for, for about a year. We introduced it with the Pascal architecture, and it, it takes into account one of, the, one of the features of VR rendering. When we render in VR, we're rendering a large flat image, and then we're actually crushing the edges of the image to make it be distorted. Imagine it's no longer a flat image, it's actually a curved image. And we have to do that because of the optics, and then the optics take that and they flatten the image back out, wrap it around your head. Um, and and that's, that's how rendering is done today because you can only render to a flat plane. So the observation there is that when we distort that image, we're actually rendering the edges and the corners of the image at much higher density than we need to. So if you look here, I, if you look at the green circle, you can see the green circle in the left and right images stays the same size. The middle of the screen, we're rendering the right number of pixels for the density of the output. But if you look at that left-hand edge, you can see we're actually rendering about twice as many pixels as we need to. And up in the corners, it's four times as many pixels. Now, typically in a high-end rendering situation, shading your pixels is your bottleneck. And we want to avoid um, over-rendering in those areas. So the, sol the, the solution we came up with is called multi-res shading. What we do is we cut, the, we cut the, um, the render target up into nine individual pieces. We can render each part of that render target at different resolution the most appropriate resolution for after when it's been distorted. We save all that pixel over shading, we wind up with exactly the same image. We're not throwing any quality away. And that's the important point here. We're not just, we're not just scaling down the edges because no one looks at the edges, we're scaling down the edges because we were already rendering too many pixels at the edges. So that's multi-res shading. We've integrated that into Unreal, um, it's out there. Now you guys who are graphics programmers are probably like, well I can't submit all my geometry nine times. You know, this is gonna save me on the pixels but it's gonna kill me on the geometry side, right? So the cool thing is, is that the Pascal and all the graphics cards after that, they have this thing called a fast viewport broadcast, which means we send the geometry in once and then we can cast that geometry out to multiple viewports. And this was designed for things like cascaded shadow maps, it's great for doing cube maps, but it's also perfect for this kind of thing. So we actually don't incur a huge cost for having to resubmit our geometry nine times. Submit the geometry once, send it to nine different render targets, all at the right resolutions, stitch it all back together at the end, we get a big performance increase. So that's in our VRWorks SDK today. It's been, been in there for about a year. It's integrated into the UE4 public branch. If you're an Unreal developer, you can just go get that. Um, we've seen in the Infiltrator demo, we've been able to see a, a shading rate improvement of around 30 to 40%. Everest was around 40% improvement. We've seen 50% in some of our internal demos that have just crazy expensive pixels. So it's something that if, you, if you're interested in getting high performance, this is, this is a, an API that you should be taking a look at. Okay, so with Pascal, we wanted to take that to the next, next, the next sort of level of performance. So we have this thing called simultaneous multi-projection capability. So 
what we're actually doing is we're taking a render target that would normally be a flat image, and in clip space, we can actually warp it. So we're actually effectively correct, creating a render target that has different pixel density in one corner compared to another corner. The way we do that is inside a clip space, before we go to perspective divide, we're actually messing with the W coordinate. So any, any developers know what the W coordinate's for? No, you know about homogeneous coordinates? Okay. I knew about that stuff 10 years ago. I'm a bit hazy on it now, because I mostly do marketing now. But that's what we're doing. So we're, we're playing with it inside, inside a clip space. We're actually effectively bringing the corners of the image forwards. So it's even more efficient than the multi-res. It's closer to what we want, and it's also extremely efficient. So that, that's what we're showing here. We're, 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 instead of cutting the screen up to nine pieces and doing each piece discreetly, we're cutting the screen up into four pieces, which are almost, you could almost think of it as like, almost like a patch inside of clip space. And, and that's what we're doing, and we see a nice performance improvement there. But that wasn't the only thing we added to Pascal to accelerate performance for, for VR rendering. We have this functionality called single pass stereo. So when you're rendering in VR, you're sending geometry for the left eye, and then you send geometry for the right eye. So you're sending exactly the same geometry twice. It'd be really nice if you could send the geometry once and then just change the X offset for the left eye, the X offset for the right, right eye. Okay. Until Pascal, um, hardware couldn't do that. With Pascal, we've actually added a little bit of functionality into the hardware so that we can just create the right eye from the left eye using an offset inside a clip space. So it's a big performance improvement if you're doing a lot of geometry. And this works through all of the geometry stages, so it'll work down inside tessellation and hull shaders and things like that. So if you're running a lot of heavy um, subdiv surfaces, doing a lot of tessellation, maybe you're doing displacement maps, it'll work in all of that stuff. So it's pretty cool, it can be a big performance boost. So obviously if you can use lens match shading with single pass shading, you can, uh, single pass stereo, sorry, you can get a huge performance improvement over uh, a Maxwell based card. So you, you can see four or five times performance improvement easily if you, if you take advantage of all this functionality together. So it's pretty cool. So let's completely change tracks and talk about audio. So George Lucas once said that um, sound and music is 50% of the experience of seeing a movie. Video games, VR apps, it's more interactive, so maybe that percentage is higher. Danny Boyle said that he was playing with the Dolby Atmos stuff. They've got a booth back there. He was saying that sound is 80% of the experience. But So with VR, what we're trying to do is we're trying to accurately model sound. So we synthesize the sounds, or we have um, you know, samples of the sounds. But we're going to take the direction that the sound's coming from into account, and we're also going to take propagation into account. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to do a head-related transfer function. This is my, this is my acronym of the day. So um, basically taking into account that sounds arrive at one of your ears slightly before the other one, um, and that sounds actually bounce off your head and bounce around inside your ears before they get inside your head. So we're actually going to model all of that. And the way we do that is we're using ray tracing. So we have a proxy version of the geometry in the scene, and each surface in the scene is tagged with a material. And we can send a sound out into the scene, and it'll bounce around the scene, and it'll reach you from different place. So right now you're hearing my voice from that speaker, that speaker, from my mouth, from bouncing off the ceiling, from bouncing off the carpet, right? So it's got a certain reverb to it that's actually generated by the scene. But you can imagine that most video games don't do that today and the sound's kind of fake. So now we're gonna be able to make the sound much more realistic, it's gonna be much more immersive. And that's not just for video games. I mean, again, if we go back to our example of, let's say we're designing a restaurant, like, no one likes a restaurant that's really loud. So maybe you could model the sound inside the restaurant and see what it feels like sitting in different parts of the restaurant. And you'd be like, you know what? I was going to go with laminate on the walls, but I think I'd rather have wallpaper because the restaurant's half as noisy if I have wallpaper. So that's something that, that you could learn through VR that would be, that would be an expensive mistake, right? If you made a restaurant, you decorated it all, and as a result of your decoration, it was too loud to eat in your restaurant. You wouldn't want that. So that's another thing we're doing in VR is the simulation of audio. Next thing I want to talk about is 360 video. Already talked a little bit about this. At, at, who was at SIGGRAPH? Did anyone go to SIGGRAPH? Do you see the pufferfish display in our booth? So pufferfish are in there. They make this crazy, um, it's kind of like a crystal ball. Um, and they can display 360 degree videos on their crystal ball. What we did was we took three 4K cameras and we ran them into a laptop and we ran our stitching API on the laptop. And then we sent that out to the pufferfish. And the latency was third of a second maybe, 
not even, I don't, I don't even know what the latency was, but it wasn't very much. It was, it was enough that you could basically call this real time. And you can imagine if you were on set and you're making a VR movie or something like that, you could use this puffer fish as a confidence monitor. Um, but there's a lot of other fun things you could do with it. And then, you know, this stuff can also live in a server and you could be bulk processing large amounts of, of 360 video. And the, the, the idea of our SDK is you guys have complete control of the input, complete control of the output. What we're gonna do is focus on the bit that we're good at, which is GPU accelerating the, the process of actually warping and stitching the video together. And, and you know, obviously GPUs are great at anything like that because it's a hugely parallel problem that we need to solve. Okay, again, I'm just gonna completely change direction. <laughs> I want to talk about tools for a minute. So we have some of the best tools in the industry for debugging um, real-time 3D graphics. We have this product called Ensight. And Ensight supports Vulkan, it supports advanced graphics debugging, like being able to go in and actually debug shaders and reload shaders on the fly. But it also has support for Oculus. And that's for Direct 3D and OpenGL. Um, and it's pretty cool, so let's, let's take a look. So any Unreal developers in the audience? Okay, so this is an Unreal frame. Um, and we put markers in so that we can actually debug it and look at it. And if you actually look, you can see that they're rendering, for each pass, they're rendering a left eye and then a right eye, and I've kind of annotated some of that, but you can see in the performance graph that it's annotated. So you can see the bulk of the time in this scene is actually static, opaque, light mapped objects. That's, that's, that's the longest, slowest part of the scene. Um, and then maybe you would want to look into that and figure out why that is the slowest part of the scene. So you could start to drill in and try and find out which particular objects were slow, which particular shaders were slow, that kind of stuff. You're trying to figure out what is it that's my bottleneck? Why, why am I slow? And then, you know, we get down to the point where we can help you debug shaders and you can be like, oh, this shader's got too many divides in it or something like that and, 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 and improve the performance that way. But it's really useful to be able to get this feedback in real time. Again, I'm going to completely change direction. So, in-game photography has become this huge thing over the last few years. There's people out there who, what they love to do is they love to go into games, and they love to modify the game so that it runs at really high resolution. Maybe they add expanded color gamut. Um, they completely change the shaders, and they make beautiful images. And there's people who buy these things as art. There are art galleries that sell in-game video photography. There are people who, you know, become famous because they make awesome-looking screenshots inside of video games. So we were, we were looking at that and we're like, can, can we be part of that? Because it's much easier for us to, to add some of this functionality to a game than it is for an average consumer. A lot of these guys are developers, right? They, they know how engines work. They can get into the source code and change it. But that's out of the reach of the average consumer. So we're trying to do, help the average consumer do that. So we come up with this thing called Ansel. And Ansel basically lets you, put any game that supports Ansel, you can pause it at any time. You can move the camera around and then you can take a picture, and then you can apply filters to the picture, you can render the picture at much higher resolution, expand the color gamut, but the thing that's interesting to you guys is we can also take a 360 degree VR picture. So that means that in any video game, you can now basically capture 360 degree um, images, which I think is kind of cool. So this uh, product is already in a couple of ship games, so it's already in uh, Mirror's Edge Catalyst, that ship last month. Um, I had great fun playing with this the other night because obviously the, the, the lady in the game is, you know, she's very beautiful and you've got her on top of buildings with advertising signs behind her and you can move her around and get the sun in the right place. It's kind of like you're a fashion photographer. I got, I got to channel my little bit of my inner fashion photographer, my, my dream of traveling around the world photographing beautiful women for a living. Um, that never panned out, unfortunately. But, um, <laughs> But this is nearly as good, and it is really cool. A really, really different experience, and you're able to create beautiful art. And obviously, as you know, as people in the industry, that's great because people are now taking our product, expanding it, and then sharing it with their friends. Net result is their friends go out and buy the game, right? So that's that's great for all of us. Um, another game that we put this technology into is Witcher Three. Witcher Three was a huge game last year. It's expansive. It's kind of like a movie scope level of game. Um, and we have a ton of NVIDIA features inside that game. All the fur inside that game, all the hair inside that game is rendered with our tech. Again, you can come by the booth. VR Funhouse uses the same fur in the game. You can come by, check that out. It's pretty cool. So we have a Android app um, that you can download. I'm not sure if we have an iPhone version of it. It was Victoria. Not yet. It's coming soon. <laughs> So the cool thing about that is that you can download this app, you can put it into a cardboard or whatever headset view you have, and you can take a look at these 360 degree images that you and your friends have created. And also, the people can use that to market games. 
So there's a bunch of people doing that. But you can also do it with iRay as well. So we can create you know, photorealistic, physically, not just physically plausible, but physically based shading models of products and houses and buildings and things like that. And you can share those. So if you're a marketing guy and you're like, hey, I want to show people what my product's going to look like in VR, then, then that's, a, that's an avenue to, for you to do that. So that's pretty exciting. All right, so I'm now going to switch to talking about building scalable content. Who's a developer and didn't see John Carmack's rant last week? So John Carmack did an awesome rant on Facebook last week about how to make your content look good, especially on low-end machines, especially on Gear and Galaxy and stuff like that. So if you just Google John Carmack, anti-aliasing Facebook, something like that, he did, he did a really good post on that stuff, on how to get rid of aliasing and make your stuff look good. Really recommend that you guys take a look at that. Um, so there's some really simple stuff you can do, like make sure you're running MSAA, make sure you're using mipmaps. This is all in, all in John's post. Uh, you know, there's no need for me to really go through this. The one that, the one that I am going to call out is he said, avoid geometry that's alias, that aliases. So we had similar problems when I worked on PlayStation 2 in that things like power lines, very high contrast. You have a black power line against a blue sky. So it's very high contrast, and then it's only one pixel wide, so of course it sparkles. And we're in a VR headset where the resolution isn't as high as we like. It's going to look bad. And the simple solution for a lot of that stuff is just don't render it. Get rid of things like power lines. You don't really see the power lines when you're driving down the street in a car anyway. So why, why are you rendering them? So one piece of advice, if you're looking for an art look to try and make your game look great on, on a low-end system, I would honestly suggest you go look at some PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, early Xbox games and look at the color palettes they, they chose, and look at the complexity of their geometry because they were trying to solve the same problems. They didn't have MSAA. They were running on low res, relatively low-resolution televisions at the time. If you're using Unity or Unreal, a lot of the time you can just go in and you can just flip some switches and your game's just going to awesome look great straight away. So have a look at those. Go find some videos on how to make stuff look good. Make sure you're doing it. Because you may be leaving a lot of money on the table just by not checking that you're running in the right set of settings. Um, one of the things I like to talk about with scalable content, because you guys might be making a game that's going to run on a phone and you might want it to run on a twin 1080 on us as well, right? So how do you make the same product that runs across that breadth of different hardware types. And what you can do is you can add sizzle without changing the stake. So what I'm talking about there is things like, if you've got a particle system, add more particles, add more smoke, add more fire. It doesn't change the game. What it does is make the game look better. Same thing with post effects. Maybe you don't have ambient occlusion on a Galaxy Gear, but on a 1080 you can add, we, we, you know, we have all kinds of plugins for ambient occlusion. You, you can make stuff look way better without, you don't change any of your assets. You're not changing the story of your game or any of that stuff. You're just making the graphics look better. So that's, that's something you can think about if you need to run on a wide, wide range of hardware. And you know, let's be honest, the guys buying 1080s, those, those guys, they spend a lot of money on software. They like to buy good things. You know, they're, they're, they're going to be kind of like your whales or whatever. They're going to be spending money on games. So you do want to reward them with a little bit extra for spending more money on, on the hardware. OK, so I'm nearly ready to hand over to Victoria. But I, I used to have this inspirational slide, and I've changed it a bit. So in 1994, Jurassic Park came out. You see the red box in that image that looks like a cooler? It's a little, little kind of red box behind the guy. So that's a silicon graphics crimson, and that was one of the most powerful computers in the world at the time it was used to make um, Jurassic Park. Weighed about 150 pounds. It is in no way, shape, or form, in any way, compatible, uh, competitive with the cell phone in your pocket right now. Cell phone in your pocket is between 100 to 1,000 times more powerful, depending on how you think about it. Right? It's, the funny thing is they run the same operating system. They're both running a version of Unix, basically, and they're both basically using OpenGL. So, so there's a kind of there's an interesting uh, kind of genealogy of computer hardware. So who thinks we might be able to do the matrix? Okay, so this is my next slide. This is our DGX1. Okay? We just released this. It's mainly meant for deep learning. Um, but it is a beast. It has eight Tesla P100s in it, so that's our top of the line GPU, eight of them. It has 128 gigs of HBM2 memory, so that's the fastest memory. It's all interconnected between all of those graphics cards. It runs 170 teraflops, 768 gigs by second, pulls 3200 watts. It weighs 140 pounds, right? So it's lighter than that silicon graphics indigo. So 20 years time, you'll have that kind of power in your pocket, or more, I hope. So this is our developer program. 
please sign up, follow our developer program, uh, follow us on Twitter, like and share, you know, all that kind of good stuff. But I'm gonna hop, hand over to Victoria because we're running a little bit slow, so. But thank you. I've never used a Mac before, so I might do this totally wrong. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Thank you, Dave. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, we wanted, I wanted to spend some time today um, talking to you about VR Funhouse and how, how we created it and all the amazing technology that's inside it. But before I start, how many of you have tried VR Funhouse? Awesome. Thank you, excellent. I hope we have some questions at the end too if I don't cover anything. So my name is Victoria Reggae. I'm the product manager for VR Funhouse. I also do a couple other things at NVIDIA. Um, work with HTC and Oculus and do ecosystem development. But this is the most fun thing I've done uh, recently. So VR Funhouse, as Dave said, is our first game that we released as NVIDIA. And what it, what it is, is um, we realized a few, a while ago, as we were trying different VR experiences, that physics is a real problem. And, re and simulating reality when you're in an immersive experience and something doesn't behave the way you would expect it in reality, like when I put the clicker here and I, it, it stops, right? When you do that, in, uh, in a lot of cases in, in VR, if you haven't built in the, the physics, you put the clicker there and then nothing happens. Or you, or you, there's, um, and I, I do this myself, there was a, a VR trying that had a table and I forgot that I was in VR and I put my elbow and I, you know, almost fell. I didn't fall, but I almost fell. So <laughs> what we decided to do was um, just, it started out as a tech demo. We build a lot of tech demos at our company. Um, we have several different pieces of technology in our GameWorks SDK. Um, we've spent many years uh, helping game developers um, as well as um, content creators in the, in the movie industry here simulate, um, realistically simulate hair and fire and water. Um, a lot of those things are, are extremely hard. Um, we spent a lot of time figuring out ways to do that. And so we thought about how could we do this um, in a tech demo and make it the most realistic uh, tech demo in, in VR ever. And that's kind of how it started and then morphed into a game. So the basis of VR Funhouse, it's like um, an old time carnival and it's, uh, or boardwalk experience. And um, we did a mix of games that you would experience at a carnival or at a boardwalk, like the shooting gallery, um, we have whack-a-mole in there. Um, the clown painter is very similar to the water gun clown game that you would play. Um, at the carnival. And then we also took a few ones that we'd love to have at a carnival but probably aren't too safe, like swords with, with balloons, um, fire, fire archery, and uh, cannon ski. And so we really actually built these different mini games uh, in, inside the game to show off some of the technology. So the fire archer we built was to show off flow and realistic simulation um, and rendering of fire. The balloon knife game uses our physics technology um, and also uses haptics. So when you have the two swords in your hands and you tap the swords together, there's a little bit of haptic feedback. Um, when you um, slice the balloons, I guess, I don't know, when you, when you, when you use the swords to slash the balloons, uh, the confetti that comes out is actually um, particle simulation, so you can interact with it. So as, as you're moving the swords around, the confetti is moving around like it would in real life. I was just at the Adele concert, um, and she released a bunch of confetti. A lot, it was a lot, a lot of confetti, and it reminded me of this because you're just like trying to get it out of your face. But, um, but it's, that's one of the most fun games that when you're watching it on the monitor, it doesn't look like that cool, but when you're actually in, in VR, it, it's pretty spectacular. And then Clown Painter has flex, so the, the goo guns that load up, um, that you shoot into the clown's mouth, um, you can actually 
for any of you Ghostbusters fans. You can actually cross the streams. Um, you can shoot yourself in the face. Um, and actually, that that game is one of the more graphically intense um, uh, intensive games of all of them. Um, so the guns will reload as you're as you're waiting. Destruction is always fun. Um, so in the shooting gallery, after you shoot the objects, you can actually shoot through the shoot through the wood. And then our hair works technology is in the mole boxing and in whack-a-mole. So when you get a chance to try, make sure you like, I don't know, tap them around, touch their hair, they're springy, they're really fun to interact with. Um, so you can play with them a little bit and then give them a good punch. So a lot of these are all of our GameWorks technologies that um, when we created the technologies like physics and flex and, and destruction and hairworks, we didn't build them for VR. We didn't think about them for VR. So as we started building out the, the demo, um, we, we ended up going back to all of those technologies um, and working with all the folks who created those and said, okay, let's think about how we do this in VR. Um, and so we, we worked with folks all across our company to, um, to figure out how to get all of that working in VR. And then on top of that, we also have an SDK called VR Works. So Dave covered um, some of the things that are featured in VR Works SDK, like multi res shading, um, lens match shading, and a, f and a few other things. So we try to build like the ultimate tech demo that has everything in it. And then we realized that. Um, it was a lot of fun, and that it was an actual great VR game. And so what we did, um, July 14th, we released it on Steam. It's actually built all in Unreal Engine, and um, it was really, really easy to do. Um, it took, let's see, it took about a year um, for us to build the game, but that was with maybe six people. It was mostly artists. It wasn't a lot of... Um, there wasn't a lot of, of coding. And then also consultation with all the different GameWorks um, folks to, to build that technology in. In addition to uh, making it available and, and it's free to play, um, we actually are working right now to um, open source um, VR Funhouse um, and make all the blueprints and all the assets available in the UE4 editor so that everyone can can create their own. I personally will figure out how to get a GPU to the person who builds me ski ball because I really want to play ski ball. Because um, that I've been asking for that for a while somehow. It doesn't use enough of our technology. This one, I was told. Um, it went down the priority list. <laughs> but you know, it's it's a really great game. When when we first uh, showed it back in April, um, we showed it running on two. Uh, GTX 1080s plus an additional GPU for the physics and what we've been able to do is is scale that um, so that it, it works um, on a 980 Ti, a single 980 Ti or above. But the best experience is going to be a 1080 and then another another GPU uh, for uh, for the physics to have the, the best experience. So what are we what are we showing it on here? I don't know, booth. Two 1080s. So definitely come by and, and check it out. I put this in here because there, there are recommended um, specifications for, um, for the different settings and the different quality level. And there's actually a CPU requirement too. So um, for the best possible experience, uh, like I said, you're going to want to go with a 1080 and another, and another GPU. Um, for physics and a Core i7. What we set out to do is build the most immersive, the most interactive um, experience possible. So we, we always build everything for, for the high end first, right? Um, the reason for that is because we, we want it to be the most realistic and we, we're constantly trying to push the boundaries of, of VR. There are, there are a lot of challenges in, in VR, and I think we, as a community, have made a lot of progress, but there are also um, many more problems to be solved and, and many more challenges to overcome to, 
uh, to make great VR experiences and to make it something that's not just part of people who come to VRLA's everyday life, but to, to bring it to the, the rest of um, the community and uh, to let other people enjoy it. So we're really excited about the um, challenges and we're really um, also excited to see what people are gonna do when we release the open source and mod very soon, hopefully. <laughs> so that was it about VR Funhouse, and I didn't want to spend too much time talking about it because it's it's much more fun to go experience it and play. Um, but I'd love, you know, for those of you who've already tried it, if you have any feedback for me or any suggestions, I'd love to hear it. And then if not, you know, Dave and I will be in the booth, and you're more than welcome to come by and, and give us your suggestions. I'll just leave you guys with our, our, our website and, and the SDK information for, for our developer program. Does anybody have any questions for either me or Dave? Yes? Yeah? Um, I have a few questions. Um, so I think, yeah, it sounds for you, microphone. Um, for your single pass uh, VR rendering, you're doing where you put the geometry in once and you get both perspectives. You're still doing all of the shaders for each eye separately, correct? Yeah, there's, there's no way of getting around that because that's after the perspective divide, right. so you're not, then you've got two different scenes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I guess my, my question's for you. Uh, so I'm new at a couple of them, I'm being I'm newly oh. hired at a company. Uh, I'm an Unreal guy. Um, but I'm at a company that has its own engine for training simulations now, and uh, we can really use that integrated, so unlike Unreal, where it's already integrated. What would the pipeline be? Like, how would our CTO get in touch with you guys so that I, as a more high-level developer, could take advantage of these things in our engine? Instead? So all of that technology is on our website. It's either in our GitHub, so you can just download it, or you can go to our website and download it from our website, and you can get it. Now, if you want to build a relationship with NVIDIA and come in and talk to us and show us what you're working on and get us excited and stuff like that, we love that. We do that with all the major game developers and a whole bunch of different people, all industries, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just come talk to Victoria and I once they kick us off the stage. Yeah, we'll do it. Thanks. Sounds great. Yeah, Dave, you want to? I was just going to ask about the, uh, by the way, I played the demo this morning and it is the most fun vibe experience I've had to date. So. Uh, highly recommend it. Thank you for sharing that. On the um, streaming VR piece that you showed, is that software publicly available? What What's the availability of that setup with the three cameras and the So for the, for the 360, so we have, there's a URL on our website where you can put your email in and when the SDK becomes available, we can, we can make sure that you know it's available, you can come to the website and get it. I don't know what actual form that'll be, if it'll be on GitHub or if it'll be a, you know, uh, a Something that's already pre compiled. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, thank you guys so much. If you didn't get a little NVIDIA bag, I have a few more over here. So feel free to come up and uh, grab that. And thank you for your time. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.